What is neurohacking? What is nootropics? You've probably heard this thrown about over the past few years uh, when people are talking about, I take nootropics and my brain is working on another level. I'm taking these smart drugs called nootropics. You've got to check them out. Maybe you've heard this in conversation, but you don't quite know what it is. You don't quite know what nootropics do. Maybe you don't even know what neurohacking means. Today, we're going to find out. Today, we're going to talk to the co-founder of Neurohacker Collective, who takes a complex system approach to medicine and well-being science. We're going to be talking about all the toxins that are in your living room and in your kitchen and in your life, how spending so much time indoors is affecting your life, and what we can do about it. So we're going to get geeky. We're going to be talking brain health, nootropics, smart drugs. Mr. Daniel Schmuchtenberger, great to have you here on the show, sir. Thanks for having me. Fun to be here. So let's, uh, let's dumb this down to the very simple. What is neurohacking? Neurohacking is a general term for any kind of applied neuroscience, applied neurotechnology for optimizing the nervous system, optimizing the mind-brain interface for various cognitive goals or psycho-emotional goals primarily. We could also be talking about neurohacking for kind of sensory motor neural purposes or anything that has top-down neurologic control, whether that's you know, aspects of health and regulation, immune system, longevity. But when we talk about neurohacking in kind of contradistinction to the whole field of biohacking, we're generally talking about uh, cognitive and psycho-emotional tuning and upregulation. Okay. So to the uninitiated, what did you just say? <laughs> Cause it sounded very interesting. It sounded, it sounded very complex. What does it mean in a nutshell? Tools for increasing cognitive capability, intelligence, focus, memory, etc., and for increasing psychological well-being. Awesome. Okay. What is preventing us from just being naturally gifted in our intelligence and, and having an optimized nervous system? Like what's going on today in 2017 as we're recording this that's preventing us from, from you know, having that kind of optimum capability? Mm -hmm. A tremendous amount, actually. Uh, so we, if you look at our interface with the modern technological built world and you look at what uh, our, our evolutionary biological history is, and you look at the places where there's suboptimal interface between those, it's in almost every area. So whether it's uh, eating food that came from topsoil where the agricultural method had it deficient in micronutrients, trace minerals, no, where even if you're eating the healthiest food that you can get access to, you have fundamental nutrient deficiency. And those are the nutrients that make not only all aspects of physiology function, but brain specifically or whether we're looking at ubiquitous toxicity, like the volatile organic compounds that are in paint and flooring and so much uh, you know, carpet, so much interior toxicity or external environmental toxicity, organophosphates, BPEs, phthalates. Uh, you know, most of the organic, most of the toxins that we are exposed to, and we see study after study of um, breast milk in mothers in the United States having 200 plus petrochemicals. Those are, those petrochemicals are either endocrine disruptors or carcinogens or neurotoxins. They have a real effect. And then we also have pathogens we never had before because of antibiotic resistance, because of the amount of global travel, because of pesticide resistance. So um, as you share uh, the effects of artificial lighting, the uh, effect of the amount of time people spend in fixed postural positions with a fixed eye focal length to a screen. So many of these things are things that we can work with, but are suboptimal to the human condition. That's just on the physiology side. On the psychology side, most people don't have the connection to a tribe that would have been part of the, an evolutionary biology of humans feeling meaningfully connected to other humans, don't have a sense of connection to meaning and purpose, have and a level of stress from the worldview that they have come into and from the macroeconomic system and maybe from other macro global issues. So all of these are uh, stresses on our physiology, our psychology, our nervous system that are going to have a suboptimal quality of life and performance if we don't work with them. Mm. 
It's fascinating. You're talking about, um, you know, the food we eat, probably the cleaning products we use in our kitchen or bathroom, um, staring at a screen. Obviously, I talk a lot about the dangers of, of looking at too much um, electronic light. Sitting down as well. There's a great book called Get Up by James Levine, which talks about the, the problems of uh, humans sitting down so much and how that's affecting us. Um, and then I, I assume what you were talking about when you were talking about emotional um, capability was, um, of course, Dunbar's number of, of people, I think was about 150 or 160 people when we used to be in tribes, that was the number. But now it seems like even if we're, con if we're connected to more than that, which would make you feel like you were popular because you connected 250 people, it seems to suggest that actually you become less happy the more people that you know or the more people that you're connected to or the more people that you have to keep up with so can we just break down each one each one of these things let, let, let's just look at the food we eat for the time being like if i go to whole foods down on fairfax and santa monica boulevard in west hollywood here can i be sure that the foods i'm eating from the salad bar at whole foods or the kale or the spinach i'm buying from the in the plastic bags are going to be okay for me or is what you're arguing saying, you know what, chances are it's still going to be pretty bad for you. I don't want people to feel <clears throat> hopeless or, uh, <laughs> but you're about to make us feel hopeless. <laughs> no, I mean, is buying food that is, um, from a, a farmer's market or someplace that is local fresher going to be a lot better than other sources. Yes, very likely. Is buying food that is organic uh, likely to have less pesticide residue and maybe more uh, trace mineral? Yes, those are worth doing. Now, even in, uh, even in organic crops, will we still find glyphosate and other organophosphate residue just because it's being sprayed nearby? Yeah, we find that. And is the topsoil going to have the microbiota and trace mineral density of what you know an indigenous and primitive environment would have. No. So it's better. It is still not ideal. And people aren't, aren't going to be eating the variety of foods they would in a natural environment that are seasonal and that are, you know, each pulling different minerals out of the soil and air. And they are going to have an increased need for certain nutrients because of toxins and stresses that they're processing. So what we're arguing is basically we, we don't have an evolved process for dealing with organophosphates our glutathione pathway, our cytochrome P450 pathway, none of those pathways were, were evolved for dealing with petrochemicals because they weren't part of our evolutionary environment. And so given that we have the exposure to those things, it's actually uh, important and beneficial to support our system to deal with the world it happens to be in. So how do we ensure that we're eating the best quality foods and what's a practical way that we can do that? Um, outside of someone foraging or having a garden where they can really ensure that themselves, uh, <clears throat> I would say farmer's markets are great because it's someone else having a garden where you can learn about the farmer, learn about their methods, find one you like well. Likely you can get something there that is, you know, less hours since it was uh, harvested than at a grocery store. Mm. And outside of where that's viable, then going to uh, local co-ops and local health food stores is going to be probably the best usually viable option. And then of course, understanding the different things that are in there, which is that not everything in a health food store is actually healthy and not everything that's healthy for one person is for someone else. And is there one question that we should ask our farmer at the farmer's market when we're about to buy the kale or the spinach or the strawberries or the bananas or the fruit or whatever we're about to buy? Is there one question we should be asking and one answer we should be looking for to ensure that we're giving ourselves the best opportunity to get the healthiest food we possibly can? Well, you might have one question being that you framed it that way, which I'd love to hear. I, mm. I would generally ask what, what are their growing processes and practices? Mm. Okay. So I'd want to get into how they enrich the soil, what kind of, uh, you know, do they use rock flowers? Do they use uh, different kinds of uh, mycorrhizae and, you know, soil en enrichments, pesticides, proximity to other pesticides, how long from when they're harvested so they'll get in. Um, obviously the more one knows about anything, the better they can do to navigate that space. Okay. We're talking to Daniel Schmuckdenberger, who's the co-founder of Neurohacker Collective. We're going to talk 
uh, to him a little bit uh, about uh, a product that he has as well that's going to help you with your um, with your brain and to give you brain nutrients. Um, I had a, uh, a, a cleaner come to my home um, just the other day here in Los Angeles, Daniel, and uh, she was complaining that I didn't have enough products in my, um, in my apartment for her to be able to clean with. She didn't bring her own products. She, uh, she you know, came and was reliant on me. And she asked me for next time that she came to buy a product um, the name of which escapes me. I think it was Clorex or something like that. And it was clearly like a, ter a bad chemical. Um, what product should I be buying to clean my home or to make available? Like what, what kind of natural products? Because it, it seems like everyone's like, oh yeah, get this. And it's like these vicious chemicals which are doing this. It seems like permanent damage to our brains. Just for a little bit of context. Um, Ammonia is an amazing, beautiful chemical, right? Chlorine is a beautiful uh, molecule. Uh, all of the chemicals that we have developed, I mean, DDT is a fascinating chemical, right? Um, mm. and, and so the better living through chemistry, the problem was that we didn't understand complex systems. We didn't understand whole systems. And so we understood one very narrow part of a system. We developed something that would be good for that part of a system, but it had other effects. Those other effects were called externalities. We started to understand those externalities and realize the problem of the externalities on both the environment and our physiology. So, you know, most of the pharma meds are actually really fascinating chemicals for the one pathway they're affecting. It's just that they affect other stuff, which mm -hmm. is very problematic. So uh, it's not that it's not that bleach or uh, ammonia or lime away doesn't have some application where it's possibly beneficial, but we do want to be conscientious of the fact that the, those chemicals have effects on biology, that even breathing them have effects on biology after the fact. And those are, they're not effects on biology that we want to have unconsciously. So you have companies like seventh generation and Heather's and things that people can get even in the grocery store that are more eco-friendly, both from uh, their effect on the environment and their effect on humans in the environment where they're clean. Um, and then you have some, uh, companies that make really kind of high tech things with uh, high tech nature tech cleaning products that can be very effective with different essential oils and uh, saponified natural fatty acids and so those are cool. Yeah, I'm not I'm not affiliated with any of the the companies I'm about to to mention, but Seventh Generation certainly I have a couple of those products and I'm glad that you said that because that makes me feel good about buying them. Um, and then there's Honest the Honest Company, which is the the company created by uh, the Hollywood actress, Jessica Alba. Um, and uh, are you familiar with their products? Are the Honest Company products healthy, as healthy as I can get as well, Daniel? I have seen them and uh, heard good things about them, but I can't speak to the chemistry okay. off the top of my head. Okay. Uh, you mentioned global travel. How is global travel affecting our nervous system? lots of things. I was speaking from the point of view of pathogens, which was before we had global travel, we had the pathogens that would have been within a bioregion that would have been things that we had evolved immune system and microbiome to deal with well. And when we travel, we have the possibility of getting exposed to a lot more pathogens that we don't have innate immunity to deal with. And so there's, of course, beautiful things about our ability to travel and get exposed to other ways of looking at the world and you know, people, worldviews, but uh, there are there are other effects of that that we have to be conscientious of. And uh, so the answer of just more vaccines for every place you go also has consequences. And so it just, these are, if we have a system that's going to be exposed to more pathogens and pathogens that it didn't evolve to deal with in recent history well, then again, we would just say that's a place where we want to have more immune system support just like we'd want to have more detox system support if we're exposed to more environmental toxins. Let's highlight just a couple of other problems and then we'll get into some possible solutions here. Um, staring at a screen. Um, what are the problems with that? Well, beyond the, um, the backlighting and the lumens and the specific kind of uh, <clears throat> the Kelvins, the specific kind of spectral frequencies of light that I imagine your listeners all understand quite well, a few other things that can be problematic about it is uh, that it's a fixed focal length. And so if I'm looking at a computer that is 12 inches or 18 or however many inches from my face, then the focal length of my eyes for being able to focus very close and very far uh, is not getting engaged and those are muscles. 
And mm. in an evolutionary environment, we would have been not looking at a very fixed focal length for all that much time, right? We would have been looking further off and seeing trees up close in the process of that dynamic movement of the eye musculature to be able to focus near and far is part of what helps keep that musculature healthy and prevent the kind of uh, vision loss that we consider so natural with age. It happened before computer screens with books for us, but fixed focal length for a very long period of time. There's an easy solution for that, which is every 15 minutes, half an hour that you're looking at a book or a screen, just look far away, you know, and let your eyes focus. Look at something very close, let your eyes focus so the musculature stays engaged. There's also a postural effect of if I'm looking at a screen, uh, if it involves me not moving very much, then of course we have all of the neurological myofascial effects of just being very sedentary. But if the posture, if the ergonomics themselves have me looking down and taking the S curve out of my cervical spine, the C curve out of my cervical spine, you know, then I'm going to be dealing with those uh, postural effects. So computers are awesome. International travel is awesome. And to, to the degree that we're interfacing with it for one set of reasons, but it's having other effects. We just want to understand those effects and know how to uh, augment any possible negatives. Because I, I got a, uh, a lifespan treadmill desk and I'm, as I'm recording this with you now, I'm standing on it. I'm not actually walking on it at the moment, but I, I now for the most part work at a computer standing up. And initially I thought I was so clever, but then I realized that, um, I didn't have a computer stand on my desk. So my computer was actually down at kind of chest level. And so my head was kind of, you know, aiming down a little bit rather, rather than straight. So here I was for months going, I'm so clever. I'm on a treadmill desk. I'm standing up, look at me. And then I was like, Oh, actually, hang on a second. My spine is probably still slouching over because I'm looking down. So now I have a stand and the stand, um, my computer and my laptop sits on top of that stand. And as you can see, I'm talking to you now, Daniel, my eyes are at, um, you know, my, my head and my posture is exactly the way it should be. I'm speaking to you from home on my couch on a laptop. So uh, laptops are, are pretty profoundly suboptimal ergonomics. And as much as we can say that we'd like people on, um, not on computers, which is uh, not necessarily a, realistic for what the work they have to do in the world that's also meaningful or that we want them on ergonomically uh, perfect computer setups which when they're traveling is going to be hard at least understanding the dynamics so one can counterbalance them but for most people the ergonomics that are going to be important is if you're looking straight ahead uh, meaning not down and not up you would like to be looking slightly up from there if you're going to be in one place for a long period of time so that the natural C curve in the cervical spine is being supported rather than otherwise. So where we're generally looking a little bit down, then we end up getting the muscles in the back of the neck and the suboccipital muscles getting tight, causing all of the kind of dynamics that come from that. And so if someone puts their monitor higher than they normally would, where the center point of their monitor is around eye level, uh, and then they usually want their keyboard low and we can get into ergonomic keyboards so that the shoulders aren't up that, uh, that's generally keyboard low, monitor high is a kind of first rule of thumb. I love it. Well, I'm, I'm now you've inspired me to put my computer up even higher now. So I'm going to make sure I do that when we, uh, when we finish this interview. Thank you for the, for the tip there. Um, two more things I want to talk about um, uh, before we move on to a little bit more about neurohacking. But we're talking to Daniel Schmachtenberger. And you can check out what he does over at neurohacker.com. That's neurohacker dot com you can read all about what it means to be a neurohacker um wi-fi i love wi-fi i be everywhere i go now when i travel it's like i need wi-fi i need wi-fi we're all addicted to wi-fi when i was down in sydney australia recently they've got free wi-fi on bondi beach and when i was uh traveling through the baltic area in latvia lithuania everywhere you go is public wi-fi free everywhere i'm in my apartment here in los angeles i've got the super duper high speed Wi Fi just running through the, the whole place. What are the potential dangers of Wi Fi and or too much Wi Fi? This is a tricky and harder to answer question. Um, when we think about wireless uh, transmission in general, so we're talking about EMF and RF. So we're looking at Wi Fi, we're looking at Bluetooth, we're also looking at 60 hertz uh, EMF that is the AC in our house. We're looking at uh, EMF fields from batteries, motors, etc. What we're also looking at uh, 
police signal transmission, military signal, you know, other frequencies of radio. Um, what we know is that the total amount of wireless energy that people are exposed to has been on a power law like Moore's law since the 60s. As we have had more cell towers and more satellites and more frequencies, uh, we are doubling the amount of transmission that we're exposed to something like every 18 months. That means that we are in a very high number of order of magnitudes more uh, total wireless transmission than we ever were in an evolutionary environment. That that is gonna have some physiologic effect is pretty easy to buy. Uh, that basically when you measure EEG, when you measure EKG, you're measuring biosignals and that there's actually electrical signal processing that is how we work, right? The electrical signal processing is core to how our, our nervous system works, that it's sensitive and that all signals end up affecting all other signals through wave interference. Uh, exactly how it affects us, there is a lot of research that is conflicting on and different countries have done research very differently, largely based on the how big telecom is affecting the way their government does research. Um, very much like you know, pharma, uh, effects of uh, you know government funding research. So we're actually doing a meta-analysis and structured review of all of the research done from all the company, all, all the countries in the world right now on the topic of wireless transmission, and you know potential cancer effects, potential um, oxidative uh, effects of sub-ionizing radiation in humans and other biology. So we actually should have the best information on that topic available soon, but we still have a lot of interpretation to do. And when you're doing meta-analysis where the in initial pieces of data that you're looking at are questionable to begin with, it's tricky. But I would say that uh, for people to be thoughtful about their exposure is warranted. And to take easy steps like not keeping your cell phone near your bed at night and not having unlimited amounts of cell phone and other access and turning your Wi-Fi router off at night. Just the easy steps one can do uh, seem very well warranted. And anecdotally, many people who have left cities and went to places where they had almost no wireless exposure in deep wilderness uh, describe psychoneurodynamics, especially sleep issues, but anxiety, anorexia going away now, whether that's just because being in nature is beautiful, whether it's the stress of the city, whether it's smog, I mean, there's so many factors that that's close to meaningless on its own. But we also notice a number of people who've put themselves inside of Faraday cages and found much better sleep. So I would say that research-wise, we don't know fully, uh, but there's good reason to think it's something worth paying attention to. Is it possible that <clears throat> 10, 20 years or two years or whatever, we're going to realize that cell phones and Wi-Fi uh, is going to be as damaging to us as we now know that smoking is, is to us for years. Nobody realized, nobody thought that smoking was bad for you. And then all of a sudden in the fifties and sixties, it still started to sort of catch on. Or oh, actually we're starting to see some correlation here between smoking and being unfit and heart disease. Is it possible that one day, not so long from now or a long time from now, we're going to wake up and go, damn, I cannot believe we were using the Wi-Fi. I can't believe we were using cell phones. We were absolutely killing ourselves. Entirely possible. Damn. I would <laughs> say that it is probable that we will realize some effects that seem unacceptable to us. With, I'm not quantifying how much compared to cigarettes, but some effects. Now, <clears throat> cigarettes are pretty easy, which is we just don't actually need them, right? Mm. Um, Wi-Fi and just wireless energy transmission and not just wireless, but energy transmission in general, we're just not going to go backwards from that. Um, so I think one of the things that's going to happen is we're going to start realizing that just like, you know, we're not going to stop having cleaning products. We're going to make better cleaning products where we pay attention to how the molecules and the cleaning products actually interface with biology. I think we're going to start paying attention to understanding biosignals better and what are the primary kind of EEG, EKG, cellular signaling, biosignals that are most sensitive and uh, starting to develop wireless transmission thoughtfully in terms of the spectral ranges that it works in to how it'll interface with biology, where like Tesla hypothesized that it could actually be a, a healing force rather than a illness force. 
All right, let's do one more before we move on to some uh, talk about nootropics. And uh, I want to talk about a little bit about Qualia, which is a, a smart drug that you have developed. Um, we're talking, you talked a little bit before about uh, emotional feelings and the tribe. And I mentioned, you know, Dunbar's, um, I think it was 150 people. That's the tribe. How are we, how are we struggling with either having too many Facebook friends or having being connected to too many people? Like what, what's, what's going on here? How is this affecting, uh, affecting us? So the primatologist Dunbar, took an observation <clears throat> that many people had had previously, which is that most indigenous tribes capped out at around 150 people, give or take, maxed out around 225 in a few cases, but generally 150. And then if they got bigger than that, they would bifurcate um, or intentionally limit their size. And there's a question as to why, and he found that there was a similar thing that happened in all kinds of primates, and that the size of the troop they could hold was actually proportional to neocortical volume. And the idea was that we actually have a limited number of unique relationships that we can actually process well. And so when you've got about 150 people, you can actually know everybody in that village well, know their lives, their history, what's going on. And that works. If you're going to have a, a village where everyone is going to impact everyone, knowing everybody, caring about everybody, being able to see in real time your effect on them is part of what makes social cohesion works. As soon as you start having enough people that you actually can't track everybody, then you start having anonymous people. And you start having people where if they're suffering, you don't kind of care as much. And then you can have effects that could lead to them suffering, but you don't care as much. So you can't have social cohesion in the same way. Now, obviously, we are not going to move back to a world of just Dunbar number tribes, because you also would then have to have technology that only is, you know, is back to the technology of that time where you're only affecting that number of people. And obviously our technology extends our impact to now global. Um, there's, and there's actually what we can think of, that was the first insight. There's multiple Dunbar numbers, which is numbers where different social dynamics occur. One-on-one -on -one is the first, right? Then small groups, three, four, then up to about 12 or 15, et cetera. So it's really not a problem how many people you've been exposed to or how many people you have friends on Facebook. It, there is a, need to have some deep, meaningful interactions with some number of people, which will probably be less than your total number of friends on Facebook. And it's important to understand the difference of in-person, deep, meaningful human interactions where you deeply know them, they deeply know you, and you can be authentic with each other than the kinds of interactions that are mediatable over uh, social media. So stop focusing on trying to get 100,000 Instagram fans and Facebook likes and start really going in and, and, and concentrating on the quality of relationships rather than the quantity. It's imp I really want to say I'm a technologist. Mm -hmm. um, I am just about right use of technology, understanding all of the effects of it. I have nothing wrong with someone getting 100,000 likes on Facebook if they're sharing a message that's meaningfully benefiting the world and having more people hear that that is actually making a better world. I just want them to understand that that doesn't equal deep interpersonal human connection and that a bunch of people liking them on Facebook also isn't going to give them a meaningful sense of esteem. It's going to give them some quick external reference dopamine hits uh, that can cover up the fact that something in their childhood didn't teach them who they were and made them externally referential for other people's approval about who they are. But it's not bad to develop a following. It just needs to be for the right reason. And if the reason is self-esteem or connection, it's the wrong tool for that job. We're talking to Daniel Schmuckdenberger, the co-founder of Neurohacker, uh, Neurohacker, I should say, Collective. Um, Daniel, what are, what are nootropics? A lot of people ask me about this and I don't actually have a very clear answer. Um, but just explain to me what, what, it, what exactly are nootropics? I'll make a distinction between three different terms that are often used kind of synonymously, but are worth uh, defining differently. Brain nutrients, nootropics, and smart drugs. So when we think of brain nutrients, we think about nutrients that would be part of a natural diet uh, that are involved in healthy brain function that either we might be deficient in or that we can actually utilize more of and it will uh, you know, meaningfully bolster our capabilities. So we're talking about vitamins and minerals and antioxidants here. So uh, to the degree that there are 
key nutrients. So when people are talking about the effects of minerals like magnesium or lithium or zinc or et cetera on brain function or vitamin D or phospholipids <clears throat> or essential fatty acids, those are all brain nutrients that one would ideally get in a healthy diet. But because again, like we said, it's very hard to get adequate amounts of those in a healthy diet and we have increased demand because say we're talking about B vitamins, we, to the degree that you're experiencing more uh, psychological stress than you would in an evolutionary environment, you're going to burn through B vitamins quicker. Um, so supplementing the appropriate brain nutrients can be useful. The distinction there is that's going to take you from deficiency to not deficiency, which means your normal healthy baseline of cognitive and psychologic function will be supported. It's not going to move you beyond baseline capacity because those are elements that are part of the evolutionary environment, right? So smart drugs and nootropics are distinct in that they are not nutrients that would be part of a normal diet. They are some kind of uh, additional set of chemistries, synthetic or natural, that are going to try and modulate some systems uh, for enhanced capability. So nootropic generally means a chemical that can enhance some aspect of cognitive function like memory or focus or attention or verbal fluency or task switching. So some nutrient that can modulate some aspect of cognitive function beyond someone's normal healthy baseline without meaningful side effects. Mm. That's the general definition of a nootropic. And then a smart drug is uh, usually, and these terms are, don't have solid semantic definitions. They're, they're kind of uh, slang terms, but I'm, I'm going to give you the best general definitions. Smart drug are usually pharmaceuticals that have some cognitive benefit generally for off-label purposes. So these are um, either psychiatric meds like ADD or Ritalin or Wellbutrin or narcolepsy meds <clears throat> like uh, modafinil or Alzheimer's meds or Parkinson's meds, levodopa, things like that, that can increase wakefulness, increase focus, increase, you know, something. Um, smart drugs can enhance some aspect of cognitive function that someone uh, wants to experience. And, you know, hypothetically, this could be not just pharma drugs, but any drug. You could put cocaine or methamphetamine or other drugs into those categories where they do modulate some neurotransmitter like dopamine in a way that will have some cognitive effect, but usually with some meaningful side effects. Immediate side effects like they might upregulate focus, but increase anxiety or paranoia or irritability or something like that. Um, and they might also have long-term side effects, which could be anything from like real physiological issues, hepatotoxicity or something, but also just dependence, right? Addiction forming because they're taking something like dopamine or acetylcholine or glutamate or some neurotransmitter usually that your body naturally regulates and they're overriding the natural regulatory process to spike it. And in doing so, if you do that enough times can actually override the natural regulatory process where it becomes dependent on that exogenous input. That's what we call addiction. Uh, nootropics, the goal with nootropics, and it's why it's like kind of a, an almost like magic unicorn idea, um, is that there are some chemistries that can be added to the system that can enhance some aspect of function without creating meaningful short-term or long-term side effects. Mm. So, of all, so obviously the way that you're describing it, nootropics improves your cognitive function above your average functionality without the side effects. Smart drugs, if we are to take your explanation, is, are, can also improve cognitive effect and they're good for things like ADD and Alzheimer's, but they come with problems. They come with potential short and long-term effects. And I think there was a third one there, brain nutrients, right? I think you broke it into can you just explain brain nutrients again as opposed as that is different from the smart drugs and the nootropics mm -hmm. essential fatty acids essential amino acids vitamins minerals antioxidants the things that you would normally get from food that either you're not getting enough of from food or that it's beneficial to get additional amounts of based on what uh, mm. you know what we're exposed to how much we're actually using our brains and the cognitive load uh, so these are basically 
uh, brain nutrients are either going to be things that could be found in food or things that could be found endogenously in the body that the body would make from food. Gotcha. Okay. So you're obviously a proponent of nootropics of all those three, correct? And brain nutrients, but not so much with the smart drugs. Well, again, like I said, bleach has a right application mm. and um, any drug can have a right application. But in general, there is such a, there is such a profound complexity to how human physiology works. And complex means something different than complicated. Uh, uh, a circuit chip is complicated. It was designed externally. You put a certain number of transistors, link them in a particular way. A cell is complex. It's self-organizing. Its boundary is non-arbitrary. Complex systems behave in fundamentally different and, and more... Uh, organizing dynamic kind of ways than complicated systems. So when we look at human physiology and especially the brain, it's such a radically complex self-organizing uh, dynamic homeostatic system that we don't want to override that, right? So if someone's dopamine is low, our goal isn't to just give them in chain dopamine or a dopamine agonist. It would be say, to say, well, let's see if we can understand the dopaminergic system better and see how to support that system's endogenous regulatory capacity so that the intervention that we're doing actually leads to lasting upregulation rather than short-term stimulus and then lasting downregulation. So in general, for all kinds of inputs to biology, I'm interested in things that understand and that seek to better understand the body's natural dynamic homeostatic processes and seek to work with and upregulate them rather than override them. Gotcha. Okay. So let's go back to Neurohacker Collective, um, which is the organization that you, that you co-founded. What is its purpose? What is its mission? And what is unique about its approach to neurohacking and applied psycho neuro optimization? Yeah. Um, so Neurohacker Collective, our goal is optimizing the mind brain interface for the optimization of human experience and human capability writ large. And so we are technology agnostic, meaning uh, biochemical technologies that's both direct to consumer like nootropics and nutraceuticals, as well as things that uh, could be, you know, doctor mediated for uh, medical conditions and general things that are direct to consumer are going to be and neurohacking, the way we think of it usually, is not for curing illness, but for optimization, well-being, support, and enhancement. Um, but a complexity approach and a systems biology approach to medicine is also very meaningful and part of the deeper research that we're involved in. Um, but so, you know, we work with biochemical solutions. We work with microbiomic solutions. We're interested in genomic solutions, in neurotech, transcranial lasers, transcranial direct stem, alternating current, you know, ultrasound, EEG neurofeedback, as well as psychotherapeutic and, you know, meditative technologies, working with the human hardware and software. We're interested in anything that basically can upregulate some aspect of human experience to have a better human experience or human capacity um, for any kind of person or condition. And the reason why this is so meaningful for us is all of the other issues that we care about in the world beyond human experience and capacity are affected by human experience and capacity. All the major problems that we see environmentally and socially, uh, et cetera, are caused by human activity. And the solutions need to come about through human activity. So upgrading the comprehensive collective intelligence of humanity, not just cognitive intelligence, but uh, interpersonal intelligence, you know, et cetera, ends up being a meaningful lever for every other thing worth doing. Now, to that extent, you've created uh, your own product called Qualia, Q-U-A-L-I-A. -A. Um, and I'm, I'm presuming this is a nootropic, right? Yes. Okay, so tell us a little bit about what this is. Like, so tell us a little bit about why Qualia is a little different and what typical experiences people might have if they take this product that you've created. Mm-hmm. 
So like I said, we're working in a lot of different areas of technology. Qualia is the first product that we have brought to market. We have quite a few other products and trials that will be coming to market this year and then some relatively difficult ones that will take a little bit longer but are, are uh, developing well. Uh, the goal with Qualia was when we look at the give or take $15 billion a year domestically in energy drinks and how much kind of caffeine stimulus happens. And if we look at the estimated something like $5 billion in off-label Adderall use, not justified doctor Adderall use, which we can question if it's ever a good thing, but just people who are for their midterms or finals or tech startup, whatever, seeking that kind of enhancement because there is an increased demand for productivity uh, and cognitive productivity beyond what there's ever been while having more things trying to distract from focus and, you know, also stresses on the nervous system like we've talked about. Uh, the thing about Adderall and other smart drugs and just shit tons of caffeine is that while they can positively affect some metrics, which is why people use them, many of the other metrics that are critical are actually being downregulated in real time. So we can see uh, for most people when they're taking Adderall, that their focus will go up, their drive will go up, but certain aspects of creative thinking and systemic thinking and even aspects of memory go down, let alone emotional things like empathy going down and then long-term health effects. So we wanted to see, can we develop something that would meet the same need, people's desire to be able to go into creative productive flow states where their full cognitive capabilities were uh, available? Um, can we do that more comprehensively than has been done so far and more safely? Um, and we started by doing this in integrative clinical settings where we were running people's whole genome. We were running a lot of clinical chemistry. We were running brain scans. We were getting medical history. And we were really dialing in custom, you know, personalized chemistry for people. Then the question was, could we take some element of that that would work across a bell curve of people and you know, and meaningfully be able to affect them because personalized chemistry at scale is tricky. We're working on it. We're, we're actually working on moving from the one version of qualia to multiple versions in the future, all the way to, uh, you know, lab based, fully customized um, chemistry, pharmacology. But uh, we, we were really surprised at how well we were able to do taking a systems approach to nootropics where we were, you know, we started out by modeling when people are taking some smart drug or uh, something to that effect, what are they really seeking? And so we did the kind of the cognitive science of they're, they're seeking increased short-term memory and long-term memory and speed of memory and digit span and verbal fluency and task switching and creative thinking and critical thinking, you know, analysis and synthesis and a bunch of emotional things like emotional resilience and drive. And, you know, so we were looking at that whole set of things together and then saying, all right, we want to be able to affect that whole set, not a subset of it. And then what are the underlying physiologic pathways that mediate all that? Which ones are mediated via acetylcholine or glutamate or catecholamines or ion channels? Or So we mapped that out, used kind of systems dynamics for looking at how those all interact with each other and the, and the pathways that regulate them, and then looked at the chemistry that maps to those and then started our kind of hypothesis development process for what we could do to upregulate all of those systems simultaneously in a way that would actually upregulate the regulatory capacity of the system, where after someone had been on it for a while, rather than get addicted and downregulated, it could actually have lasting baseline elevation. So let's just say I take, I take Qualia. Uh, what's my first week going to be like? What's a typical experience of someone who uses qualia in the first week and then, you know, second, third and, you know, short term and then long term. Um, <clears throat> so we have done a bunch of internal, uh, you know, single blinded trials. We're just uh, engaged in our first uh, double blinded trials right now, uh, but we don't have results. I can't make any claim about what one will experience. I can say what many people have claimed um, and many people is, uh, quite large numbers for us now. Um, and obviously it's going to be different experiences for different people. I want to say first, quality is actually not recommended for everyone. There are contraindications. Um, specifically, if people are on psychiatric meds or neurologic meds or treating cancer or treating hypertension, then we would not recommend people use it without consulting 
their appropriate healthcare practitioner first. This doesn't mean that there are not healthcare practitioners that are using it and recommending it for such people in knowledgeable ways. But we wouldn't recommend people do it on their own because there are chances of interactions. So that said, uh, for people that it's not contraindicated, we're getting an extremely high positive success rate. The, the small percentage of people, about 16% of people that describe a, a null effect, they don't experience very much, are almost exclusively because they have sleep issues. Um, if people are not getting adequate delta sleep, so if they're not sleeping enough or not sleeping well, qualia will usually not work well for them because memory consolidation happens during delta sleep and we're specifically working with chemistry that is mediated through the memory consolidation pathways. So one of the things we say is, you know, that it's, that it really is critical that people are sleeping well. And if you have apnea or noctori or something like that, probably going to need to address that first of the people who are using it and having good experiences. Um, there are testimonials on the website, but increased focus, attention, concentration, insight, uh, actual emotional steadiness, emotional regulation, uh, many people describing increased epiphany, <laughs> increased empathy, uh, all of those things are fairly common. All right. We're talking to Daniel Schmuckdenberger, co-founder of Neurohacker Collective. I just had a look on your website while we were talking there and I see a couple of uh, testimonials of people that I actually know. <laughs> There's uh, Erica Lee and TJ Anderson. There's a few people there I know who live down in the San Diego area. Um, uh, if you're listening to this and you want to follow uh, the work of, uh, of Neurohacker Collective, uh, there is a Facebook page called Neurohacker Collective. You can go and like that page and be kept up to date with everything that Daniel Schmachtenberger and his team are doing in terms of emotional resilience, nootropics, outsmarting the modern world as we've been talking about. Uh, is there anywhere else where our listeners uh, can find you, Daniel? Anywhere else you'd like us to go? I think the uh, Facebook page and the website are good resources right now. If you go to the website, um, you'll get a hint on the ethos page of what we're working on beyond what our current offering is. Uh, but mostly you'll see information about quality. And there's a decent bit of information about uh, the chemistry and the scientific approach that we use. And, you know, there's information that's worth looking at. The blog has some uh, very interesting articles. Um, but what we're really working towards is being able to vet all of the different technologies that can meaningfully enhance people's psychology and cognition. This is everything from the psychotherapeutic technologies to psychedelic assisted psychotherapy to, you know, all forms of neurotech, really vetting which ones are effective and that are effective not just at short-term and partial effects, but uh, positive system upregulation. And then effective for what? For what kinds of people, for what kinds of pathway issues, et cetera, being able to synthesize all that and then being able to develop a platform where people can upload personal data that is uh, synthesized with a you know unique kind of um, AI-like combinatorial algorithms. They can then be able to direct people to uh, what technologies have the highest probability of being most meaningful for them for the kinds of things they're wanting to work on. And then being able to have a deeper version of that available uh, for medical practitioners, really pioneering the future of personalized medicine where we can synthesize all of the diagnostics and synthesize all of the therapeutics, customize the therapeutics based on this kind of deeper interpretive model. And so uh, we don't say too much about that yet because, you know, we want to sh share about the things as we're able to release meaningful offerings. But if you keep uh, checking in, you'll see more on its way. Terrific. Well, thank you very much for explaining the difference between nootropics, smart drugs, and brain nutrients. It was a fascinating conversation. I'm going to make sure that um, my farmer's market down on, uh, let's see, what's, what road is it on? I think it's on Santa Monica Boulevard. It might be on something else, actually. There's a farmer's market that I've been meaning to go to, but I don't go to it because I take the lazy route. Um, I must hit that, na hit that now and start asking uh, the types of questions that you ask, that you encourage me to ask. So I appreciate that. Um, thank you very much for sharing your experience, Daniel. I really appreciate that. If you're listening, make sure you like uh, the Neurohacker Neuro Collective Facebook page. Uh, and you can go and check out more at neurohacker.com. Thank you, sir, for your time. I appreciate it, Daniel. James, I'm, I'm really happy to see all of the uh, 
important, empowering, brilliant work you're sharing with people. And uh, it's a delight to be on here. Thank you. Thank you, sir.